politics has become dirty not just because the bad people got in but also because we the so called good people and good citizens we stayed up i want 10000 people to come out onto the streets protest the zoo and i want us to unal this our guys are laughing they said are you smoking dope over 6000 citizens are protesting against the government's new rule one year of logic reasoning rational didn't work out one protest with 10500 people did the trick so that showed me that power of people works i am i am a person who has no political ambitions at all i am an accidental politician as i call myself rikan kejriwal bhi aise hi tha just kejriwal aise hi tha na how did you reach here how did 2000 and 2024 happen what's your journey b- between those so let's quickly break it down and break it down into two parts the first part will be quick um, the corporate career i joined icsa venture from campus um, and then uh, i switched out ernst and young before venturing out on my own uh, uh, with some of my friends uh, in this uh, venture called as veda corporate advisors which mancho knows uh in fact uh, mix your uh, wife maili also knows about uh, veda and me we have interacted with her in our corporate development avatar so uh, so i've been predominantly in the private equity so, so, venture so capital 2000, 2000 you came to what pwc no 2000 i joined icsa venture icsa venture from campus mancho and i mancho and i were together at uh, icsa venture from campus and that was from campus okay from campus yeah. it was part so, of icsc group recruitment yeah so i was there till 2003 interestingly in between i had a stint in one of the portfolio companies i went out and joined the portfolio company and then came back into icsc venture and ultimately i moved out of uh, icsc venture in uh, september 2003 uh, so, then so october 2003 3 years in 3 uh, years in icsc venture and then it's not exactly to... two years you can take out one year in between in that portfolio company so i have been two years in icsc venture and one year in that portfolio company called okay. relq software okay right so that was that and then 2003 october i joined eny uh, so 2003 to 2005 eny and 2005 veda corporate advisors along with my other friend mancho knows them as well my other partners venkat and vinod so um, that i was doing for so many years as uh, one of the co-founders and uh, one of the shareholders uh, in at veda so overall i think i would say very happy with the corporate life uh, uh, i banking uh, advising companies mergers acquisitions private equity venture capital uh, some very solid relationship got built up during that time which is holding me today in good stead there still people coming back to me seeking advice and all I probably know. the only part around my um, i i c s a e n y to veda is that mm. uh at some point i realized that i don't want to be in the corporate world uh so how do you define was, corporate that that was i c s a corporate yeah so i i would say i wanted to be more in an entrepreneurial environment than in a corporateish kind of an environment uh in a large firm when we are doing a lot of work uh you see that there's a lot of politics going on right there finally there there is too much of effort that's going on to claim credit uh to sort of say that hey i am better than so and so uh you know i need to go up and i need to exercise control influence power all of this and many of them are focused on doing that and not focused on actually getting work done but i realize that i can never play power games or uh, politics uh, against these people to keep moving on so i said uh, and uh, around the same time venkat and vinod had actually stepped out they were also in eny they had stepped out they had started veda they reached out to me they said hey do you want to become a partner we'll become co-founders we'll do this together idea immediately appealed to me so the same stuff instead of doing in a corporateish kind of a setup we felt that we would be able to do it uh, much much uh, much more happily and much more freely in a uh, uh entrepreneurial kind of a setup and that's one of the best decisions that i have taken and the great so you thing co- there is you co-founded veda. you co-founded veda uh, you, you were the employee in veda initially you co-founded it no 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 i joined as a shareholder and a co-founder only so I, for me i i didn't want to be an employee you know they had reached out and i said i'm happy to join if i can be classified as a co-founder and shareholder as well 
uh, they and they were immediately okay with it because it was about a year since they had started and they were anyway in the early stages they had not even a, uh, a closed uh, probably they had closed what one or two deals uh, at that time so it had just started so uh, effectively i got co-opted in as at that time as a co-founder and uh, i was a 25% shareholder as well so and, and of course that was like in. was it like a typical corporate finance thing or were you trying to do something differently from the no, corporate typical finance corporate finance deal-making. focused on mid focus on mid market private equity mnd right. right so that's all that we wanted right. to set out and we wanted to be focused on south indian market and uh, we wanted to build some strong solid relationships do some good work and uh, just stay uh, at that level at which we wanted to do it that's all that we wanted to do so uh, one of the partner he split away from us but the other two venkat and i continued carrying on and there also as i said right uh when vinod came out we had to agree, come to an understanding on the commercial arrangements the commercial front right and now when i came out we had to enter into some kind of a commercial arrangement in all of this it's all extremely smooth we never fight with each other it doesn't get into any kind of protracted discussions or negotiations obviously there'll be some to and fro a little bit here and there but we are all completely that way you know respectful of each other and that's the beauty of this entrepreneurial setup that we've been having i have loved uh, that journey that i went through but once i started uh, bnp i went and had a chat with venkat and i told him that i want to be full time in this and i had to step off from day to day so he was also appreciative of the obviously didn't so like Shikha, it I, I, are you now are you now are you now, now full time bnp and not at uh, uh, veda anymore at all Yes, Veda, I am not involved in the day-to-day operations at all. Okay, but you hold fact, some no, equity, I guess, uh, from your. Yes, that also. Uh, given that I stepped out, we sort of did a, a readjustment, and uh, uh, there are other team members who have stepped up and all of that. So we've been distributing equity to the rest of the team as well. So it's undergone a change as well. But again, as I said, all of this involved a discussion with us and the team, and we we have settled on and then move on. Yeah, but holding some equity there. and just uh, that's about it with regard to the political journey a completely accidental and i would say completely serendipitous uh, at that time i didn't know it it actually all started with one anonymous letter there is this anonymous letter which entered our mailboxes which alleged that there is corruption going on in our apartment uh, society management uh, things are in a bad shape and then that in that anonymous letter the person who did it uh, he took out my name saying shrikant you are one of the initial people who set up this community are you happy with what's happening why are you not stepping up now types to usme se thoda josh aa gaya and then i said let me then get back in and see and then i took over as the uh, secretary of my apartment complex effectively taking charge thankfully there was not much of corruption except for some small things that the estate manager was doing i sort of fired him uh, brought in a new estate manager set up some good systems and processes and some of the equipment and all were in actually in bad shape so it was a good exercise i sort of built uh, sub committees groups with each one taking charge of each of the assets in our apartment setting that right and that one year was a very productive period and i thoroughly enjoyed it uh, where the sewage treatment plant had gone kaput we set it right the fire safety system was pretty bad set it right it was a wonderful experience uh, and in my own apartment my credibility got built up quite significantly with the quality of the work that happened and i myself realized that even though i didn't know anything about any of these systems prior to that i realized that if i apply my mind there's no rocket science to it and you can get all of that done but one interesting and important life changing event that happened at that time was the water supply board of bengaluru uh imposed one ridiculous rule which said that uh, people living in apartments now have to pay 300% more for water because you guys living in apartments you are bulk consumers so in a way that was one big turning point that happened so i uh, had formed a group of apartments in my neighborhood to interact with one another so i brought all of them together and i said why don't we start a federation federation of apartment complexes uh, to give voice and to engage with the government and authorities to at least see uh, how best we can fight against these you know really silly rules kind of a thing that's how bangalore apartment federation was born and the first two years was really horrible because we couldn't even figure out uh, what to do where to do and then there was some politics going on with a couple of people which i didn't like at all 
and i also took a back seat and the uh, federation di- almost died a natural death and then uh, around the end of 2016 the uh, water supply board again passed another ridiculous rule where they said old apartments in bengaluru have to now retrospectively implement sewage treatment plants which was physically impossible and they had their own uh, really ridiculous logic to come back uh, and say why they wanted us to do it so that time again some people who had seen me work in that apartment federation and how i uh, put it uh, together they said uh, can you take charge again and uh, we will fully support you times so then i took charge in late 2016 then constituted a completely new team early 2017 like minded people and i started reaching out to people and i said if you are coming in i need your time commitment i need you to work passionately on a few things only if you are interested in doing that come in and those are all the people who came in and i also realized that we need to start doing things a little bit more professionally so i hired a couple of employees uh, for administration marketing I initially put some money out of my own pocket to start funding that and so on and then the federation started taking off and then uh, slowly started building up more and more people started joining uh, but the biggest turning point that happened was on this rule while i was engaging with uh, the um, ministers uh, the officials the politicians all of them said the same thing uh, guys you guys living in apartment complexes you do not come out and vote you guys are rich you don't care about anything that's happening so whatever rules we put no matter how illogical how ridiculous it is please comply with it don't ask questions don't waste my time types i was shocked Uh, until that point of time i had never voted in my life and in short they were saying you guys are not vote banks for us so you don't matter to us go take a walk that's what they they said and that shook me out of my reverie so to say from then on uh, not only did i add more apartments and more people to the federation i also started uh, running campaigns to get more and more people registered on the electoral rolls to come out and vote during elections and so on so that was one big thing that happened there was a big change that happened in me which was a very important change uh, otherwise i was not interested in politics at all then the big game changing event that happened was on this rule when we saw no progress happening uh, and i actually had filed a case in the national green tribunal in the high court i used to make trips to delhi go morning come back in the evening only for the case to keep getting adjourned and finally when one hearing happened the judge talked some nonsense and at the end of the trip i came back in september and i told my governing council team of Fed, the bangalore apartment federation guys we have to organize a protest against this rule i want 10000 people to come out onto the streets protest this rule and i want us to annul this rule our guys were laughing they said are you smoking dope how are we going to get 10000 people onto the streets i said we will do this then i started reaching out to a lot of people organized ourselves across the city Uh, i created um, uh, what are called as clusters i created positions called as cluster presidents uh, got them to engage with apartment communities built some central campaigns gave them campaign material asked them to reach out within their apartment complexes to build uh, awareness around this issue and i set a date december 2nd 2017 for people to come out in a protest and 3 months of intense effort beautiful organization structure uh, beautiful campaign that we ran and uh, on december 2nd 27 2017 in 40 different locations across bengaluru and in every location i'd ask the team members to come back with a count of how many people came out i'd ask them to take photos videos uh, get people to sign etc and the count that came on that day finally uh, by afternoon when we finished the protest was 10500 people So we had actually gotten ten thousand five hundred people across Bengaluru uh, to come. And Congratulations, I can't. I can't get ten people out to do anything. So getting ten thousand five hundred people—that's just yeah. wonderful. Yeah, even I didn't so, know that we could do it, but I was so uh, obsessed about it. And that's when I realized if we put our mind to it, we can actually do it. I have so, two quick questions yeah. for you. I'm, uh, one: Does I am Bangalore fall under the Bengaluru municipality? So when you finally become the mayor. will you yeah. be able to uh, manage i am bangalore yes yes it comes under okay. what bilay kahani absolutely okay and the second question what's the brand recognition for i am bangalore like the fact that you're from i am bangalore does that give you credibility among the masses absolutely 
when i say bits pinari and i am bangalore it places me on a different pedestal altogether but uh, bass actually didn't have uh, the only thing is in bass when people saw me and and you know your uh, bits pinari and i am bangalore credentials uh, give you the base after that what you talk uh, how you engage how you drive things is what defines things ultimately uh but the brand recognition is of course uh these are all both in fact both the brands bits pilani and i am bangalore are fantastic brands to sort of uh, put out out there and it gives phenomenal recognition without any doubt uh okay. so that protest just to close that part of the story out one year i was talking logic to all these people and nothing worked when i did this protest with 10500 people on december 14 2017 within two weeks of the protest in fact we made the headlines uh, of pretty much all the newspapers on december 3rd and uh, we became really popular then on december 14 the entire government machinery bangalore development minister the home minister the mayor the water supply board chairman the pollution control board chairman all in one meeting they called us i went in uh, along with 20 of my team members i made the presentation personally and along with the team and at the end of it one minute the bangalore development minister said the rule is annulled one year of logic reasoning rational didn't work out one protest with 10500 people did the trick so that showed me that power of people works and from there on baf started becoming bigger and bigger more and more people started coming up because we started getting that uh, credibility and recognition so with that we kept on building up further and further and even at that time i was not interested in politics at all in fact um i was very happy doing what we were doing it was wonderful engaging through baf initiating a whole host of measures and initiatives but i said two things two events that actually i would say ultimately in hindsight changed my life and got me into politics uh one was uh actually an event that happened right in front of my apartment uh where uh we had been asking for one skywalk across the road uh the junction where i stay in it's a very dangerous junction to cross the road we didn't have a skywalk people were crossing the road and we kept on saying it's dangerous and we wanted a skywalk the mla and corporate didn't do anything and one fine day uh, early 2018 a 17 year old girl who was crossing the road uh, got run over by we don't even know whether it was a bus or a truck got run over she died on the spot we were all livid we were saying this this was waiting to happen and it happened then we went and uh, again started the process of uh, uh, you know going to the mla corporate nothing happened and finally we did another protest in our local area for a skywalk and the moment we did a protest and got a few hundred people in our locality out automatically the mla and corporate then got together and approved a project but then within one or two months of the project starting after they dug up the road on both sides they pretty much brought the project to a grinding halt Uh, and it turned out that the mla wanted a bribe without a bribe he was not allowing the contractor to move forward and after that despite repeated pleas and despite uh, continuous efforts nothing moved uh, and i was like really uh, pissed off with them and it showed me that no, no matter what i do through baf or through citizen groups and civic groups fundamentally our system is broken because of these corrupt and incompetent people who we have elected as representatives and we have put there so that was one event that uh, made me think really hard as to are we doing the right thing by just doing whatever we are doing another thing that happened was in an apartment complex south bangalore the president of that apartment complex reached out to me uh, in apartments we segregate garbage at each individual household level but the garbage contractor who comes and picks it up he puts puts everything into one one truck and then goes and dumps it wherever he wants to then the resident started questioning there saying boss what is the point in we segregating if that guy is ultimately going to mix it up so then we had tied up through baf i tied up with an agency called hasirudalla which is a very professional agency and these guys then wanted to go and tie up with hasirudalla and they got a call from the husband of the corporator that ward was reserved for women and most of the women on in fact all the women reserved wards the women actually don't play a role it's their husbands or their fathers or relatives who run you know the men folk who run the uh, ward as a proxy the husband so of the like corporate called rabri devi rabri devi type of corporate correct exactly absolutely she has no clue the husband will run the show uh, she is just a dummy out there 
so this guy who controls things he calls the president of this apartment complex and he says boss if you guys shift to this other contractor i will get the road in front of your house dug up i will get the pollution control board to issue notices to you running into lakhs of rupees of penalty and i will ensure that the ownership document of your apartment it's shift uh, it's still not shifted from the original uh, builder to your individual name i'll ensure that it doesn't happen and the reason why he was getting involved was because the contract was his binami and it was a mafia that those guys were running and so he was very clear that uh, you know if you go to another contractor i'll make life hell for you and this president he had seen me in action and uh, he said she can what do i do i said don't give in to these demands the reason why i have started the federation is to fight against these things so he was convinced but he couldn't convince the rest of the managing committee they ended up going back to the old contractor who again started picking up everything and dumping everything so that uh, sort of these two events apart from a whole host of other thing that i was seeing around me made me realize that politics has become dirty not just because the bad people got in but also because we the so called good people and good citizens we stayed out and that's when the idea of a political party germinated in my mind i think that's what impelled me and september 22nd 2019 i finally floated bengaluru navanirmana party as india's first and only political party with an exclusive focus on one city that is bengaluru and its municipal governance that means we will focus only on civic issues no stance on national or state level issues india china policy i don't have a view india pakistan policy i don't have a view a citizenship amendment act i don't have a view farmers act i don't have a view hijab controversy that's been going on in this country i don't have a view none of these things are at the grassroots level and i have no relevance in the municipal governance so as a party we don't take a stance the only thing that we so work on the view, about, your only view is how do we improve the lives of people in bangalore exactly that and how and do we improve the of it, quality of the how do we improve the quality of the civic amenities and the civic infrastructure the roads the potholes the footpaths the skywalks the parks the playgrounds the drains you know all of these things that impact us on a day to day basis the street lights the cctv cameras we talk of women safety cctv cameras street lights they don't exist in many places so all of these things that impact us on a day to day basis that is all that i focus on and what that means is our party will not contest the mp or mla election we will contest only in the municipal elections that is the bbmp elections my only objective is to get good citizens elected as corporators uh, every ward gets a budget of about 100 to 250 crores over a five year period ensure that this budget gets spent properly at the ward level and work towards making the wards model wards making our city the model city and ultimately my vision is to make bengaluru as the best city that we can make it so that's how my journey I'd sort love, of i'd, I'd, I'd love that into- not not because not because of anything else but uh, but uh, together we have um, spent some good years in our, of our lives in bangalore and and um, yeah that's why i i hold personally a very soft spot for bangalore i don't unlike yeah. the two of you i don't live in bangalore but yeah or bengaluru but yeah interestingly I, I uh, there are people it as my top 3 cities no absolutely no that, that i can understand that right given that we graduated from imb bengaluru will always have that uh, emotional connect for us but here is the interesting part megs there are people uh, who have been supporting bnp who have had nothing to do with bengaluru they they you know they have not lived in bengaluru ever uh, you know they might have visited bengaluru once or twice or a few times that's about it but for them the concept of a city party uh, that focuses on improving the civic amenities and infrastructure some of them are supporting it with the fond hope that one day this will become a large movement and a similar movement will happen in their respective cities as well and for me that gives me goosebumps sometimes to see that people who don't even have that emotional connect to bengaluru are willing to support me financially uh, and in any other way that they can spreading the message uh, they spread the message uh, uh, in bengaluru uh, to their friend circles and so on so i find it uh, uh, very very humbling and uh, uh, you know i i have those goosebumps experience experiences those times so yeah that's what keeps me driving but yeah it's not just the people with the emotional connect uh, the concept with its professionalism with its focus appeals to a lot of people 
and i think that's what keeps democracy alive in india or wherever else in the world it's it's a participation of people it's participation of people who want an improvement in some sort of public life or personal life and and that's democracy for me yeah yeah today at 11 o'clock i was having a conversation uh, with a person who was going to be a potential volunteer for me and pretty much in every meeting the same question keeps getting asked of me how do you ensure that bnp does not become another aam aadmi party how does she can't not become another arvind kejriwal so it's something that i keep getting all the time so it doesn't uh, hurt me any longer how do you stop that from happening because my reading of kejriwal is one is opportunistic second he did do some ghotala but he didn't do it for himself he did it to gain power like he did it to like invest money in literally advertising in goa and all that so yeah. how do you stop your party from becoming like that so first of all yeah nothing has been proven uh, whether it's congress sure. is all legit yeah you know uh, it's all obviously in the uh, uh, realms of conjecture that we are in but irrespective of that dal mein to kuch kala hai i think everybody knows that sure uh i think one of the biggest problems that aap is facing is uh aap's ambition and kejriwal's ambition is sort of overtaking the principal philosophy and the ideology in their uh, hunger to grow very fast in their hunger to become larger it's creating too much of pressure upon themselves and i think that's what is forcing them to do something that in my view they should not be doing and that's precisely what i want to guard myself against and that's why i have named this party itself as bengaluru navanirmana party i have no ambitions to go beyond bengaluru number one second in the charter document that i have registered with the election commission of india i have made it very clear that this party will contest only in the municipal elections in the city of bengaluru so i have uh, i don't want to trust myself in these things i believe that as i keep growing as i keep getting let's say a fan following and as i keep getting more and more power uh, i think that the mind will start wandering and hence i have tried to put as many safeguards and ultimately there's one thing that i say openly there is nothing that you can guarantee against and i'm saying so myself so all that we can do is we can try and put a lot of safeguards and starting with myself i'm trying to put those safeguards and i keep telling my team uh don't blindly support and trust any political party or any politician starting from a bjp narendra modi to a, a aap arvind kejriwal to a congress rahul gandhi and ultimately come back and say don't blindly support me for anything your blind support is what makes me drunk in power so the more Very you well. support me for the good things and logically <laughs> me for anything nonsensical that i'm saying it automatically makes me a better person a better leader and ultimately a better politician life generally doesn't work that easily that way but i try to keep reiterating that so that i try to prevent myself from going the way of arvind kejriwal or uh, bnp going the way of aam aadmi party so let me ask one, one question on this one question on this uh, thought because there is a very important thought of how the voter is actually deciding right and as yeah uh, you mentioned that within uh, bengaluru city limits or municipal limits uh, you want to confine yourself but even within the electorate in this area what what would be a population mix which you can convince to think that way because bulk of the voters in any constituency are not uh, thinkers in that form so first of all uh, uh, a city like bengaluru has a good mix of uh, Uh, people belonging to all strata of the society from the uber rich to the uh, let's say downright slum dwellers we have the entire mix and depending on a few areas there there are some areas which are very very dense in the slum population and there are some areas which are very dense in the upper middle class kind of population too as far as i am concerned and as far as bnp is concerned we are working for everybody all the stakeholders of the city irrespective of the gender caste religion strata uh, so we work for everybody but then uh, wix also started off with uh, something around vote banks and ultimately being in politics you can't ignore that for me one of the key vote banks that i am 
going after is the middle to upper middle class kind of voters in a city like bengaluru you typically have two types of uh, people when it comes to politics and elections one you have the middle to lower middle class kind of the strata uh, who typically go out and vote in large numbers but then there is heavy competition for that vote and there are lots of these mall practices that happen distribution of money goodies freebies etc so that's a very complicated game to play and that's a game that the big parties the mainstream parties play in the other section is the middle to upper middle class kind of the profile there's a very big voting population in this category the problem is many of them do not come out and vote so my thesis is that my message what i am communicating resonates a lot better with that strata i do interact with slums in fact there's a slum right next door which is about 200 meters away from my home the only person and the only party which has worked with them and supported them in a lot of initiatives over the last 4 years is me and bnp but then i don't know what will happen during the election time because there will these all these politicians coming there distributing money and goodies and we don't know ultimately where they will vote and the most important thing is for them when i talk about uh, fixing the roads drains potholes footpaths civic infrastructure they don't even understand what that means whereas the middle to upper middle class the message when i communicate it appeals to them it resonates with them beautifully and when they feel that there is somebody that they can support they there there's somebody that they can come out and vote for my thesis is that during the bbmp election they will come out and vote in reasonably big numbers and that's what will help me and bnp win hopefully quite a few votes how big is bangalore municipal elections how many wards there are what's the budget and second if that's on one side of the equation the other side of the equation is how big is your party is i is it you and one of your friends right like i could have started a party with chau is it at that stage is it you and your uh uh neighborhood you like 20 30 people is it you and 20 lakh people i, I don't know the 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 dimensions so just help me understand the dimensions on both sides sure so as far as bangalore is concerned uh, uh, the we have a greater bengaluru area like in you know we have a ncr area and uh, there's a, a brihan mumbai area if i understand it right also like that there is a greater bengaluru area uh, which includes areas like electronic city interestingly electronic city is a very popular area for people across the globe when they say bengaluru electronic city people know it the interesting thing is it doesn't come under the municipal limits it actually comes under a village panchayat mm, mm. not too many people know this uh, so when i contest in the bbmp election we don't actually contest in the we will we will not be contesting in the electronic city area so if we look at the uh, current municipal bengaluru area which comes under the limits of what is called as brihad bengaluru mahanagara palike which is a municipal body administering bengaluru this area is a little over 700 square kilometers it covers about 14000 kilometers of roads and by that i mean all the arterial roads sub arterial roads the uh, small roads that lead into all of our homes etc it covers a population of about 1.3 to 1.4 crore citizens wow so you are bigger than some of the countries in europe possibly yes yeah, i don't know the yeah. population there but yeah i do know yeah. that we are we are larger than singapore for sure i yeah. think most wow. of the indian metros uh, have more population than some of the most of the yeah. countries in europe wow yeah. so you are around 14 million people you are bigger than denmark i think denmark possibly. most of the scandinavian countries yeah denmark yeah. belgium all those, all those tiny yeah. bini pinni countries yeah so it's about 14 million population uh there is a big floating population in bengaluru bengaluru is a very unique city from that perspective given that it's the it capital of india there are lots of people who keep coming into bengaluru and keep going out as well yes uh, and because of that there is a huge floating population the actual registered voters in bengaluru is about 8 million or about 80 lakhs that's pretty good that's a good ratio it's a it's a yeah but this 80 lakhs is also a little bit bloated i told you about the floating population my sure. estimate is that there is at least about 10 to 15 lakh people who no longer live here in bengaluru okay uh, 
if not 15 lakhs i would estimate it to be at least somewhere close to the 10 lakh kind of a number okay so probably the real voting population who are registered and eligible to vote here and who are residing here would probably be in the range of about 70 lakhs or 7 million okay. out of the, uh, let's say 10 million people who should technically be registered as voters here the annual budget the last part of it is the annual budget for bbmp the money that it actually spends purely for the maintenance of its civic amenities and civic infrastructure is about 10000 crores that's wow, about let's say that's about a huge million. number yeah that's about 1.2 1.3 billion dollars wow and i'm not talking of uh, core infrastructure you look at the metro pro, metro uh, uh, trains the suburban rail infrastructure or the very large projects that are undertaken uh, national highways state highways that connect into bengaluru none of these are covered in this 10000 crore this is purely for the maintenance of the roads the footpaths the uh, parks playgrounds and so on so it's absolutely a significant budget Bulk of it today. I mean, that is, is such a huge amount for corruption to seep in, even unintended corruption. Well, there's a lot of intended corruption. So, and that's one of the banes uh, of the city. Uh, and in fact, interestingly, for the last four years, the municipal elections have not been held. Uh, it's unconstitutional. As per the Indian constitution, no municipality should exist without an elected council for a period of more than six months beyond the completion of the tenure of the previous council. And the tenure of the previous council ended in September 2020. The latest that we should have had elections is March 2021. So yeah, was right it now, because of the pandemic and lockdown and things like that? No, 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 no. If that was the case, then even the other elections, the Lok Sabha elections, the MLA elections should not have happened, right? Uh, all the other elections are happening. This is not happening primarily because of the 10,000 crores. The state government and the MLAs today have unfettered access to this amount. And when an amount like 10,000 crores is at play, uh, everybody wants to have a dip into the pie. So that's the biggest problem that we are facing. And lastly, with regard to the number of wards, uh, which you asked, uh, we have currently 225 wards in Bengaluru. So each ward typically has a voter population of about 35,000 voters plus or minus on an average. So that's the uh, answer to the first question that you asked. The second so, part so is second, one, one related question uh -huh. in these 200 uh, plus wards, yeah. and basically, how uh, I'm sure you would have done that analysis. How many of these wards would have a relatively higher population of this data that you are looking at, or you are uh, kind of resonating better with? I would say it's actually very difficult to say because I've not done um, uh, sort of gone into all the wards across the city in detail. But there are uh, wards that I have chosen uh, in a few parts of Bengaluru where I believe we stand a great chance. But if you were to ask me a rough guesstimate, I would think that at least about 30% of the wards, if not right. more. In fact, I would think it would be a higher number, primarily because the outskirts of the city, for example, Cho, where you are living, it used to be a village once. And these all have developed quite substantially. If you look at Bengaluru, uh, 2005, the population was roughly around 60 lakhs. Today, mm -hmm. that population is about 1.4 crores. So the city has grown phenomenally and bulk of this growth, if not all of the growth, in fact, I would say at least 80 to 90% of the growth has happened in the outskirts, in areas like where you are living in Mancho. So I would think that a good part of the population lives in these areas. And hence, I wouldn't be surprised if even 40 to 50% of the city's population would be the middle to upper middle class. I, I, and I would say at least 30 to 40% of the wards would have a fairly dense concentration of this specific uh, uh, citizen segment that I'm talking of. I hope that gives you a perspective. So, so, so 2005 to now, last 20 years, it's grown like four times and five times the population. No, about, about two and a half times. Two and a half times. Wow. Wow. It, it, that's like such a huge number. Yeah, I mean, I, I know I've not been to Bangalore for almost 20 years now. But even when I last went, comparing it that to 
the 98 99 days then we were living uh, on baner ghata road i still remember that guru garden and the baner ghata national park that is like center of the city or seems like that because outskirts are aren- It's not exactly I mean, the center of the city, yeah. but if you come back here now, uh, Mancho, you uh, uh, mix, you won't be able to recognize that part of the city that we studied in at all. The place has yeah. just changed quite dramatically, and that's one of yes. the biggest reasons for the mess that we are in. The city grew by leaps and bounds over the last twenty years. Unplanned growth, right? There was complete lack of planning, complete lack of uh, competence in determining how the growth needs to happen. and together with corruption incompetence and inefficiency has led to the mess that we are currently in and that has led to the formation of bengaluru nagarikam so shikant i get one side of the equation which is uh, the bangalore the size of the bangalore municipality and the size is much bigger than i imagined so thank you for bringing me up to speed what's this give me the other side of the equation where is bnp today i am the founder of a federation called as bangalore apartment federation Uh, it's effectively a, a federation of apartment complexes and villa communities across bangalore and uh, given that I, i am the founder of the federation and i did some lot of work and a lot of good work hopefully uh, i earned my credibility through that so a lot of the people there saw my work and a uh, lot of them are supporters and uh, one of the logical starting points for bnp is through these apartment complexes so i would like to believe that today bnp enjoys the support of at least a few lakh people and automatically where there is such a concentration or a density automatically uh, i and bnp would have a reasonably good support base having said that even assuming that uh, bnp is let's say supported by about 10 lakh people for now if you look at it in the context of uh, the overall population of bengaluru i still have a long 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 way to go so that's where right now i'm not spreading myself thin i am focusing on a few areas where we have a good chance i am still waiting for the first bbmp election to happen when it happens i intend to contest really hard in about 40 to 50 wards and uh, i am sort of kicking off something called as bnp mission 25 i want to win 25 out of the overall 225 wards and these 25 wards will be predominantly the ones that have the urban concentration or the middle to upper middle class kind of uh, concentration and run really uh, strong focused and impactful campaigns in these areas even if i win 10 wards in the first election it sets me and sets bnp up very very beautifully for the next 5 years uh, and uh, in the next 5 years i would want to build up our base stronger and stronger and unlike arvind kejriwal i am very very clear about my ambitions and aspirations i want to become the mayor of bengaluru so that ultimately i can bring about the change ultimately i can bring about the uh, level of governance that we need to bring to the 10000 crores that's getting spent on bengaluru so that it's spent properly in a logical manner in a very uh, transparent manner and in a manner that we are able to bring scientific processes professional systems to Uh, drive that growth in a very sensible manner. So, Sika, uh, are there court cases about uh, Bangalore not ha- not holding the uh, municipal elections? Oh yeah, of course. I, I, my BNP itself has been a party to the uh, petitions. Uh, we've been fighting the battle in the Supreme Court as well. So there so are Supreme some court, yeah, fundamental. Yeah, 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 Supreme Court. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I think the problem somewhere is in the judiciary as well. Um, in 2020, when the elections were not held in september the high court of karnataka actually passed a beautiful order which said uh, there was a brilliant uh, chief justice of the high court of karnataka at that time who is currently a, a judge in the supreme court uh, justice abhay oka a brilliant judgment he said uh, guys i am giving you 6 weeks time uh, the election was purportedly getting delayed because the government state government wanted to do another delimitation of the wards and bring in fresh reservation so just as abhay oka brought in a beautiful order which said i give you 6 weeks time if you are able to complete your new reservation and delimitation do it and announce the election in 6 weeks time if you can't go back to the uh, earlier uh, delimitation and reservation conducted as per that uh, it 
can't be a, a more sensible judgment than that interestingly within 3 weeks uh, the case went to the supreme court the state government took it to the supreme court the supreme court gave a stay uh, on that verdict and uh, when we imprinted into the supreme court petition it took us one and a half years to even get a hearing to vacate that stay and that's the state of affairs uh, in our country right now so it's a long battle i am very committed to ultimately ensuring that uh, every municipal election by the way it's not just bengaluru you look at delhi you look at mumbai you look at chennai you look at even some of the smaller cities invariably most of uh, at least 50% of the municipal elections keep getting delayed for the same yeah, i reason. don't think i don't think you've got the right lawyers kyunki supreme court mein log to overnight hearings kar lete hain judges ko contact karke that's what yeah, i hear you you don't understand the, i think now i understand the system a lot better than you do bigs <laughs> uh, i don't want to put something out here i know what happened at that time uh, what you have to understand is in every aspect of our system there is corruption and incompetence uh, so let me just put it that way in fact uh, that three week period uh, from the time the high court passed the order to the supreme court there's something interesting that happened here there's some collection of money that happened right under our noses uh, so i know what happened there uh, it's not an easy system at all mix uh, we have very good lawyers representing us uh, people who have done uh, wonderful cases but uh, even the best of lawyers will not be able to do certain things what i have realized is that the incompetence is higher than the corruption most times when i have worked at least in the american system and when i've seen things not work from the outside if i ask someone he said they will say oh, must be some corruption but from the inside whenever i've been on the inside i realized it's mostly incompetence what has been your understanding i i as always the truth lies somewhere in the middle there are some cases which are pure corruption there are some cases which are pure incompetence and there are others which have a deadly combination of both uh, but all i can say is that uh, corruption is indeed a way of life but then uh, there are things that happen with corruption uh, so at least things keep moving on and then there are things which get stuck because of corruption so uh, you're right in at one level because there are certain things that i also used to think i also used to think that corruption is omnipresent it is not the case there are quite a few pockets of cleanliness that we do have uh, but then either you have incompetence there or the competence is suppressed by the political class for their own nefarious benefits so that's been my experience but you are absolutely right uh, it's a very simplistic view of life to say that or oh, everything you just blame it on corruption uh, i would say there is i would put it to three things corruption incompetence and inefficiency as well uh, there are times where people are just lethargic uh, you know there is that uh, rut that people have gotten into i will give you one simple example we have been taking up a lot of civic issues of late and resolving them when we go and engage with officials today they welcome us couple of them have openly told us we wish you were there much earlier we are very happy to do work but the way the system is we have also been frustrated so we have also gone into that chalta hai kind of an attitude why should we do when you see so much of corruption incompetence and inefficiency all around you why should i be the only person who is trying to do anything which is meaningful and because of that there are people who get into that rut of inefficiency as well uh, mm-hmm. even though they are competent and even though they are not corrupt so there's a combination of all of these things going on so you just have to sort of look at each situation and each context uh with that relevance and then see what is the applicable factor that's going on and uh, you know fine tune your approach accordingly uh, i just wanted to add one more variable here one of the things which i have seen at least in uh, the government rules and so on is that a lot of times the process ends up getting designed to promote rent seeking behavior right you end up having multiple levels of power points where you have the power concentrated which automatically results in uh, corrupt corrupt and the opportunities for corruption and uh, it appears as if it is designed to promote that as well at a number of times and maybe it's part of the inefficient process or designed to be checks and balances which ends up being rent seeking opportunities but that's one other thing which 
at least i have felt no, you you touch, you're touching upon a very important aspect uh, cho just one different point of view there you're right in terms of uh, talking about power being concentrated and it automatically promotes rent seeking behavior uh, you're right about that but the system has not been designed that way uh, in fact when i look at the constitution indian constitution i am amazed at the architects of the indian constitution the way they have structured the indian constitution to devolve powers uh, from the center to the states and down to the municipalities and the panchayats it's it's a beautifully designed system there is no uh, fault with the system or i can say that there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the way the constitution has been designed with regard to the devolution of powers the problem is the people who are running it they have tried to convolute the whole thing to suit their nefarious needs and purposes so even though the system doesn't allow them to concentrate power they have managed to do it and i would say a large part of it is down to ignorance on the part of citizens and mancho given that you are in bangalore it includes people like you and me uh, if i were to tell you the constitution is very clear when it comes to municipal governance and administration what the constitution says is citizens should not only be aware of what's happening citizens not only have the right to know about what's happening they actually have the right to participate they have actually the right to take decisions uh, in terms of which projects are to be taken up and so on how many of us know this none of us know this and there's a beautiful system that's been designed that's even been documented in the act we uh, for bengaluru we have something called as a bbmp act it clearly documents how it has to be done as well and if you were to download the bbmp act and if you had the time to run through the uh, 150 160 pages you will realize that that document is structured beautifully that system is designed beautifully but since you and i and the 1.4 crore citizens are not aware of that we are not aware mm. of how it is to be done the politicians take advantage of it and that's how they centralize the whole thing that's how they ensure that there is no transparency that is there in the system and they manipulate the system to suit their own benefits and that's precisely what i'm trying to break through bnp the fundamental tenets of bnp i would i call it cat cat uh, of course we all wrote cat in a different context this cat <laughs> is citizen participation c for citizen participation a for accountability and t for transparency and the system perfectly enables uh, whoever is the elected representative at the municipal level to uh, implement this just that we have had a bunch of people who have absolutely no intent uh, most of whom do not have the competence to do all of this and we have a blissfully ignorant and blissfully unaware electorate that doesn't know about it and it's a deadly concoction so for me that's the sort of uh, uh, next or i don't know i don't want to call it the nexus that that's the vicious circle or vicious loop that i want to break and bring about some level of uh citizenship uh, citizen participation accountability and transparency into this yaar isko delhi delhi lingo mein aise bolenge ki bilkul cat idea hai cat idea ha yeah <laughs> I, i hope it's <laughs> something good you know delhi a related lingo. question cat again uh, again cat, one related idea, question oh, sorry i hope that cat idea means acha idea smart idea types yeah yeah so ek uh, ek related question uh, shikant you mentioned about a 10000 crore budget right and uh, the effect uh, that as as mayor of the city you would want to have control over how it is spent and so on now structurally is uh, in a number of municipal corporations the mayor is not such a powerful figure i mean is is bangalore also structured that way with the mayor being more a figure head than an actual controller of the because in some corporations for example like amdavar municipal corporation you have a commissioner who is practically the ceo of the uh, corporation yeah and in bangalore i believe the structure is not that way no 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 uh, pretty much every uh, corporation in this country has that same problem the devolution of powers as mandated by the indian constitution devolution of powers to the municipalities uh, has still not been done in the way it's been envisaged and in the way it's been documented as well Uh, we had a 74th amendment to the indian constitution that was brought in the year 1993 and the reality is even today that devolution hasn't the devolution of power hasn't happened 
in the way it should be done uh, but for me even without that power being vested with the mayor there are lots of things that a mayor can still do a mayor still has the visibility the mayor still can engage with the masses the mayor can still bring in ideas and that position can help create some campaigns can help create some ideas which can resonate with the public and that i'm hoping will act as a catalyst for the change that i'm looking forward to achieving which is the true devolution of powers to the municipalities and the panchayats uh, so yeah but you are right right now the bbmp act uh, or for that matter the act that uh, uh, let's say uh, empowers any municipality in any part of the country they suffer from the same problem which is lack of full empowerment it's a challenge but it's not an uh, insurmountable challenge and it's not something that will necessarily prevent some of these ideas and campaigns from being taken to the masses at least so sikant we i was trying to understand the game board right or the or the dynamics so you brought me up to speed with bangalore bangalore much bigger than i anticipated you brought me up to speed with your support much bigger than i anticipated i didn't know you were part of this uh, apartment uh, community and how much support you have over there now what i want to understand is what is the structure of bnp itself how many uh, party uh, officials you have and what's your budget those are my two questions to understand and i think that will be the last piece right to understand the whole structure yeah so the way i've structured this is uh, we have a governing council which has uh, totally 15 members uh, that's a governing body that typically sets the strategic direction and context for the party the governing council typically does not get involved in the day to day operations it sort of oversees more of how are we maintaining uh, accountability and transparency with regard to the funds uh, what should be our strategic direction uh thinking of some key areas um having disciplinary committees ethics committees audit committee so i have constituted all of that as well so that's the topmost layer then after that comes the wards the 225 wards so the way i envisage it is uh i ultimately see bnp having a leadership team in every single ward today we have it in about 20 odd wards uh where we have a a uh, set of people who are driving the initiative for us in these wards some of them actually are full time employees of bnp uh, but quite a few of them are not then they in turn have uh, so typically each ward will have what i call as the equivalent of a ward president today we call it a ward leader so that person takes the responsibility for the ward and uh, with that person we'll typically have about 5 to 10 people uh, who will be helping that person in a uh, sort of doing the reach out to more and more communities within that ward then we'll have a bunch of volunteers in typical indian parlance uh, we would use the term karyakartas so we would have the karyakartas who will be supporting them in building up the party base and presence so uh, after the governing council it straight away gets into the ward level where we have the ward level leadership team supported by a volunteer base and there i have tried to decentralize as much as i can where i let them run their own uh, uh, let's say uh, campaigns and so on uh, since many of them are new to politics many of them don't know how to do so we have created lot of central campaigns and they make use of that and drive that in their respective wards and the system that i have built in is ultimately even the decision on who will contest as a corporator from bnp for a particular ward i want the team from that ward to actually decide so there won't be a central leadership team sitting and doling out uh, Uh, tickets and seats to different people i want this to be a decentralized and a reasonably democratic setup at the ward level where the wards are sufficiently empowered to take decisions for themselves and on an exceptional basis where the leadership team needs to get uh, involved or we need to intervene uh, in case of any conflicts uh, i would rather get involved on an exceptional basis for that i also defined a framework on what we can be doing what we cannot be doing uh, that's the other thing that the governing council does uh, we set the boundary conditions uh, what all we can do what all we can't do uh, so on and so forth and we uh, give a clear uh, mandate or a clear direction to all the teams that uh, you should stay within this framework within this framework 
whatever you want to do you are free to do that ultimately let's go out and build the base for the party is the mandate given to so two questions are the people on the governing council that i might know and the second question how many employees do you have and what's your budget ha ah, yeah you are the so governing council unlikely that you will know any of these people uh, i didn't want celebrities in my governing council the governing council has not even of, the mukhya of our batch <laughs> i i don't want this to make a make it more like dynastic politics so yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh the governing council typically has people uh who have been strongly working uh at the on the in the grassroots or they've been working on issues uh that truly impact uh at the grassroots level so for example uh, there is a lady called chitra lancelot she is part of the governing council uh she runs a lot of uh, programs for uh, slums empowerment okay okay uh through her we have actually built a few campaigns for uh, running health and education programs in uh, uh in quite a few slums uh, there's a lady called uh, uh, dr bhumbi uh she actually runs a few schools for the underprivileged uh free schools for the underprivileged and uh, uh more than the traditional curriculum uh, she runs these schools in the perspective of uh, making them employable vocational training and so on uh so she's part of the governing council to give that perspective uh then some of the pa- party members who are active there's a lady called lalita uh, she quit her job in wipro she's a full time employee uh, she's also part of the governing council involved in a lot of civic issues in her area including a uh, lake rejuvenation uh, uh restoring a park uh maintaining the localities and so on so many of these people are all i would say local celebrities in the sense that they all been doing some phenomenal ground work and in their own respective communities or areas where they have been impacting they are the true celebrities so i wanted to ensure that it's people like those that are there as part of the governing council i also have an advisory council uh, there's a person called dr anand kodavasari is one of the foremost uh, experts in sewage treatment plants uh, and that has a big impact on the way uh, the water in the city can be reused uh and he's part of our advisory council uh, there's a person called dr hariharan chandrashekaran uh, who actually ran a uh, a construction company uh, which focused on building sustainable uh, communities and some of his communities uh, do not actually take in water from outside at all they are self sustaining communities um so uh, these are all the people who i think can contribute to the party's philosophy ideology and manifestos in terms of how the city ultimately needs to be run unlikely that you would have heard of any of these names but as i said these would be the typical local celebrities who have done in what my what in my view is phenomenal work at their ground level and i would like to take that body of work that body of knowledge and see how we can replicate it to other parts and that's the role that they typically play uh, by being part of the governing council the full time employees we have only around uh, eight people as full time employees uh see the budget is something that uh evolves uh, right now it's all crowd funded uh the monthly budget that i have to run this organization is about uh, 4 lakhs uh, on a monthly basis uh, i myself bring in a, a reasonable chunk of that every month to ensure that it keeps running but we are just on the verge of launching a campaign to do another crowd sourcing so typically the party is funded predominantly through crowd sourcing in fact quite a few of our batchmates have contributed including i think because you have contributed as well thanks so much for that and there are quite a few others in our batch mancho i think mancho might have also contributed um i don't remember the names of all the people but there are at least 40 people from my, our own batch uh, who have contributed to bnp different uh, uh, uh contributions of course uh, ranging from a few thousands of rupees to even a few lakhs of rupees that some people have done but otherwise also there are lots of citizens in the city who have been contributing for the cause over the last 3 uh, years i managed to raise about a little over 2 crores uh, through this uh, fundraising uh, but we need a lot more uh, step by step i'm uh, building towards that in fact i'm running towards uh, uh, rather working towards building a system where the uh, party runs on an autopilot mode where people start donating even small amounts on a recurring monthly basis and if thousands and thousands of people contribute a few thousand rupees also on a recurring monthly basis uh, we'll be sitting on enough money to consistently keep running campaigns and comfortably keep managing uh, various initiatives uh, in a way that we can reach out to more and more people 
and keep making creating more and more impact on the ground do you have like you're married and do you have your wife also in the party no 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 in fact uh, my wife is very clear in fact she is waiting for the day when i'll quit politics and become a normal human being again uh, so she, she won't be the next sunita kejriwal <laughs> Uh, there's nothing that i can you know where i'm coming life. from right <laughs> I, there's nothing in life that i can guarantee like i said before uh, all i say is i try to put systems and processes in place i try to encourage people to ensure that they become the check and ba- checks and balances that i don't end up doing any of that stuff and so i think i, I was I very encouraged any... listening to a politician uh, who is actually encouraging Uh, checks and balances because that's the last thing politicians want to do in my opinion and yeah. and that is so uh, that's so great to hear and uh, i'm probably biased because you're uh, you're from the iams and my batchmate but even if you weren't that encourages me to start believing in politicians yeah no mix uh, as i said uh, when it comes to politics i don't want to trust myself Uh, i keep telling this openly to my team team members don't blindly trust me tomorrow if some party comes and places 100 crores 200 crores 500 crores in front of me i don't know how my mind will behave at that point of time so yeah. why would you want to blindly trust me why would i want to trust myself and the best way to prevent myself from going that path and going the path of some of the others is encouraging people to keep the check and balance on me and on the system Uh, and i trying to put systems and processes in place that will prevent me from doing any of this hanky panky in the future so that's all that i can i can keep doing beyond that i don't want to make any promises which i have no clue whether i'll be able to keep up or not i believe that i'm incorruptible but then i don't want to trust myself on that so let's build systems which ensures that tomorrow in the remote chance that i get uh, tempted by something else the system that i myself have built the processes that i myself have put in place ensures that i don't go that path and in all of this we can only do it on a best efforts basis so that's all that i can say uh, last thing so that that what's to... the what's the salary of the mayor of bangalore oh those are all honorary positions sir vikas uh, that's the other thing uh, ultimately we need to bring some systemic changes Absolutely. the corporators and the mayor need to be paid a fairly good sum of money and that should become a full time job for them today it's not a full time job it's a more an honorary thing the amount is a pittance so there are all these distractions that keep coming in uh, so that's something that we have to change but that's something that has to structurally change and it can't change overnight uh, it needs a, and it's not easy to change because it needs legislation change at the state level uh, and it involves too much of politics so i'm trying to overcome that system by another interesting thing that i'm planning to do that's why i have full time employees in bnp some of these people who are going to contest as corporators are actually full time employees and their salary is actually funded by the public and i encourage more and more residents from their what to contribute to their salary and i keep telling them uh, now that you know that you are uh, paying for their salary you hold them accountable don't blindly give them all the power and all the responsibilities keep a check and balance on each one of them as well so that's the way i am building this so the way i am trying to work around that system is uh, i encourage people to become full time into bnp uh, they, let them contest as corporators let them get paid a reasonable amount of salary that they deserve to get and again that's a bit of a gray area for one person it might be a low amount for another person it might be a high amount but at least something uh, reasonable for them to run a decent life and let it be funded by citizens and the same citizens to whom they have to be accountable for and i think that will so who is a corporate a corporate is the guy who runs a ward yes each corporate each ward will have a corporator who is technically the head of the ward so we have talking about have reservation and delineation what is Sorry? reservation and delineation you talking about reservation and delineation that's the reason why it all got delayed delayed oh yeah, yeah. so what delimitation is, is the redrawing of the ward boundaries so the 225 wards they are drawn in a particular way periodically the system has to undergo a delimitation because the population for example keeps uh, changing right a population dynamics Uh, for example the outskirts have been growing at a much faster clip so you need to do a delimitation to ensure that the uh, population the a, a ro- road length the area of the wards are evenly spread across the wards 
so periodically there's a delimitation Re delimitation is nothing but redrawing of the ward boundaries reservation is uh, something that's unique to uh, i don't know that it's unique to india which is very rampant in india uh, which is there are different castes uh, and different types of uh, and there is reservation for women as well so each ward might have to be reserved for uh, women uh, there are multiple wards 50% of the wards are reserved for women uh, about 33% of the wards are reserved for other backward castes about 13% of the wards have to be reserved for scheduled castes scheduled tribes so on and so forth so the elected representative of that ward has to be a woman correct so the only people contesting election in that ward would be the woman correct so help me understand correct. one more thing sitting far away it almost seems to me that most municipalities of our metros are controlled by the state government in part would that be a correct assessment it's actually not uh, what happens is as per the constitution and as per the bbmp act the uh, municipality is sufficiently empowered that's not the problem uh there are only uh, two areas where the state government gets involved is one uh, the budget that is approved by the council has to go for a ratification by the state government uh, but it's a ratification the state government does not decide how the budget is to be done for the municipality second just like the central government has a power to dissolve the state government the state government has the power to dissolve a municipality if it finds that the affairs of the municipality are not administered properly but it's a tricky area a state a central government cannot just randomly go around uh, dismissing state governments and imposing a uh, president's rule similarly a state government cannot randomly go across and dissolving municipalities so these are there but they don't have an impact on the day to day the way the state governments or more importantly the state level elected representatives uh, drive all of this and exercise control is in a very different way typically the corporators uh the ticket is given to them that is the uh, uh let's say the ticket to contest a particular ward uh, from each of these parties that is typically that power is given to the mlas in each of these parties so uh the mlas typically give the tickets to these corporators and subsequently whoever gets elected as a corporator these mlas exercise the influence on them uh and the understanding right up front is that you cannot take any decisions without first checking with me and that's how they exercise control but if you have an independent corporator or a corporator from a party like bnp uh the person doesn't have to listen to the mla doesn't have to listen to the mp doesn't have to be controlled by the state government in any way whatsoever so that delineation is clearly there so i can understand that the high court passed a good judgment the supreme court ordered a stay and i've been involved in the court system and sometimes stays are given because i just had a cup of tea i don't want to look at it i'll just give a stay and then once you get a stay it took one and a half year for it to get heard but then okay but how do you explain the other two and a half years of delay doesn't the, so when the supreme court finally heard it what happened then there are we should have a separate session on that right since i've run a case there are so many technicalities that keep getting brought about uh, see in india there are cases that have been running for 50 plus years now if you ask me how do you explain cases running for 50 plus years there is no logical explanation to that uh, there are lots of technicalities that people keep bringing in uh, and uh, i don't think i am sufficiently qualified to explain the technical nuances as to how these people keep uh, delaying this but the lawyers in our country there are quite a few of them of su were sufficiently qualified if they want to keep dragging a case on for years and years together by bringing in technicalities there you know there's a bunch of them who are very well equipped to do that so it's using those technicalities that they have been consistently uh, pushing it again and again and but again. is it technicalities about oh, uh, this day i'm sick the other day my wife is sick the lawyers are doing this to get more and more dates or is there something structural that allows both. them to keep delaying this both one is you can keep adjourning and the second is technicalities relating to the delimitation and reservation all that the government has to do is to announce something and it becomes official and then so for example uh, believe it or not the city of bengaluru has undergone four different delimitations in the last four years but without having an election without having an election and every time they say oh this uh, one delimitation will be done uh, one politician will go and file a case and these are all hand in glove 
the government will do the delimitation and they know that the delimitation is done horribly and from their own party one guy will actually file a case saying that the delimitation is not done properly so that's what i'm saying it's a very convoluted complex maze that these so, guys Shikhar, know how to help navigate. me help me understand this the way i look at it right now the way i understand it is that you bnp like after hearing you today believe me i'll be a bigger supporter of bnp in future but okay. what i understand from this conversation is that you're at a strategic disadvantage remember when we did our strategy classes and we said that okay you have to play the game to your advantage right you're at a strategic disadvantage the guy who is has a legislative assembly he is at a bigger strategic and like he can derail your plans he can yeah. do delimitation get a case filed he has an advantage if there is no election happening so if there is no election happening the old ward uh, people are continuing no or, state government the reason why it's not government. happening is right now it's under the administration of the state government so today okay. the mlas don't have to influence any corporator the mlas are directly attached to that 10000 crores okay that is so, why but, they keep delaying it but how do you over, yeah. overcome this strategic disadvantage you are in because yeah, you are literally fighting against a goliath right you are the yeah, david he's the goliath this is way your uh, yeah slingshot but the reality also is that there are uh, 250 municipalities where elections have been postponed at various points of time ultimately elections happen so beyond a period of 5 years somewhere the courts ultimately will intervene again so that confidence i have so there is no oh, but but there is another strategic disadvantage right there is a, a we are th- th- there is a name recognition if i'm already voting for someone for my parliament or for my legislative assembly i already have name recognition as symbol recognition you don't like you, you there is a strategic disadvantage like people have limited attention span right you are absolutely right because we have a strategic disadvantage on multiple counts i can't even yeah. begin to explain the number of areas where i have a strategic disadvantage but for me there is nothing that i can do to level the playing field forget about bringing it to my advantage but the point i keep making is even within the realms of the strategic disadvantage that i've been uh, trusted with i still can bring about impact uh, not just at a very small scale at a reasonable scale so right now that's all that i'm interested in can we win a few wards i think we can win a few wards with those few wards can we have a few hundreds of crores that we can influence yes we can with that can i showcase what we can do see today even without being in power bnp is known as a party that can solve problems that some of the others are not able to solve and today in one assembly constituency the mla has given clear instructions to the officials that when the bnp team members approach please do not respond to them and despite that i have figured out a way to work along with officials and get things done so i expect the system to be loaded against me i don't want to be sitting crying complaining cribbing that oh the system is against us nothing can happen i am looking at areas where i can create an impact that's why right now i'm not thinking of the mayoral process so but sometimes when you want to create an impact you say that look you want to create impact at grassroots level but sometimes it's it is strategically advantageous to fight at the state level like i, I think no no uh, so, so, uh, quickly there because by winning the state election we we can have no uh, as in holding the election is the one part that the state government has been sort of uh, uh doing otherwise they are not able to have too much of an influence now uh, let's say in another few, few months time in uh, within one year the election will be held after that for the next 5 years we will have an elected council in place and as i said there is no municipality in this country which has gone beyond 6 years without an elected council so we are almost coming to the end of that and i think we will soon have an elected council that much i am very confident about so right now i am preparing myself for what the 5 years beyond that will hold in store and then i have already prepared the ground for saying how i will ensure that the next elections do not get delayed and i can play a political game there instead of playing a, uh, a play a game in the courts and the judiciary i can actually play a political game by actually making people aware you will never see a, a legislative assembly election or a parliament election getting delayed technically if the government want to do it they can do it but they will not do it because it will be political harakiri for them because the citizens will start voting against these people because they know that they are violating democratic principles municipal government people are not aware so gradually i am bringing that awareness and over the next 5 to 6 years when more and more people are aware i will run campaigns to tell people that 
guys this state government is acting against your interest and if they know that it's going to impact their electoral prospects in some election they will slowly start falling in line so that's the principle what's the dynamics of our state election in karnataka like who is the dominant party who is the current party in power can you help me just understand that dynamics see in fact uh, uh, this postponement of this bbmp election has been done equally by both bjp and congress congress ga- came into power exactly a year back and they have also postponed it now prior to that bjp was in power they have also been postponing it uh, in karnataka it's a very uh, unique situation where uh, it usually vacillates between bjp and congress and with jds the third party sort of acting as a king maker and sometimes the king himself uh, so on and so forth uh, those dynamics are very complicated again uh, because it will take a, a full session for us to even start going through all of that and i think that that has no bearing on the uh, municipal administration or the municipal election so i think we can stay away from that at least for this conversation very interesting so, so one, uh, one last question from my side on this uh, political part uh, shrikan so you mentioned that you want to stay in the uh, municipal corporation election arena but bangalore as a city again as vix was saying has a number of seats within the state legislature and so on so is that not a segment that you are also looking at contesting the state legislature elections from the city it won't have any uh, impact on the uh, uh, municipal governance or the municipal administration part of it uh, so no, but for example uh, like uh, now the elections are delayed for municipal corporation the mla has control over the funds in the area so similar that situation would still apply right uh, possible but uh, the counter to that is i would say ultimately i, I want to ensure that the elections are no longer delayed once we get into the corporation to some extent i would rather fight that battle than try to get yeah. as i said see one of the reasons why i want to stay away from that is mla and mp level is all policy making but more importantly right now uh two things i don't want to lose our focus i want to play a very focused game it's a big big problem to solve if i start getting diverted with all of that i won't be able to focus sufficiently on this second the ambition part of it uh it's a slippery slope as you start aspiring for more things who knows at some point some of us might be contesting for mla mp i really don't know right but you know as a party if we start getting into it it's a slippery slope that's what is le- leading to the downfall of aam aadmi party i don't want to go on that slope at all how uh, right many now, mla seats does bangalore have bangalore uh, 20, have 20. 28 mla seats yes so in fact so that is actually low there is another delimitation of the assembly constituencies that is going to come up in the next few years by the time the next assembly election happens i would think that bengaluru would have anywhere between 40 and 50 uh, assembly constituencies so it's almost 1 is to 5 yeah, because the answer to your question is typically 1 is to 7 or 8 typically about 7 and how many members of parliament does bengaluru elect right now it's 3 but that again after the delimitation that might happen for the parliamentary constituencies it might become 4 or 5 So Shikant, I remember you from I am Bangalore. Okay, you are one of the most humble guys in our batch. Like there were some guys who showed off, and there were some guys who were just humble. And I remember you as the humble guy of our batch. And that is the same personality that you are bringing to BNP. कि नहीं यार मेरे को नहीं बनना पड़ा मेरे को grassroots पे difference करना है. I don't want to be the big guy in the room. And that's the same personality I know of Shikant. But see, I am not convinced that it is the right strategy for me. what chaw is saying is the right strategy that you fight for your mla seats in bangalore bengaluru you fight for the mp seats in bengaluru because at the end of the day i'll have i'll have this one fundamental theory that the human mind i can't hold more than three symbols in my head if you like the bjp congress and jds those symbols are already in the head of all the bengaluru people and now bnp is saying acha hold me also in your head and that's like no yeah that's too much that's four symbols in my head so at least for the bengaluru people you have to be the alternative you have to be the clean alternative and then if you have 10% of mla seats and 10% of mp seats and i know that goes against your personality but then you become the king maker and then you can bring out bigger local changes and that's what my strategic thinking tells me i can answer to that uh, i can straight away talk about it also uh, 
again i don't know whether it's right or wrong but one of the things see you tell me this i go as bnp saying that i'm going to contest in these elections also there are staunch bjp congress supporters aap supporters jds supporters who are supporting these parties at the state and central level if i am going to start contesting at their level uh then in fact one of the things that actually is endearing bnp to people is the fact that we are focused only on the city one of the standard things that i go and tell people is in fact when very of them ask hey you go are you going to contest against bjp and jds when i tell them that i'm going to contest against them only at the city level but not at the mla and mp level they are very happy today in my party there are staunch congress bjp and jds supporters who do not fight with each other who uh, have openly told me shrikant in some in some of them are so uh, the things they say uh, i will not be able to come to the forefront but i'll support you from the back in the bbmp election it's a completely different dynamic unless you are here at the grassroots you will not be able to uh, figure that out one of the reasons why aap is not able to now make any further inroads is they see it as yet another party and the reason why as bnp i am able to build lot more inroads here is because they see us as a party with a difference the moment i start contesting the mla and mp elections i lose my differentiation i become yet another party i become like another aam aadmi party uh, i i have no more uh, positioning that i can stand on that that makes that's a very good reason sekant and and yeah. being so far away from the situation i respect your intellect and i'll and i'm i'm sure that makes a lot of sense yeah so when i started i was still, still not sure but after having been in this for 3 4 years this is a beautiful positioning pretty much most of the people that i have interacted with no matter how staunch they are in fact including including from my own batch naru for example is a staunch bjp supporter and what he has said is shrikant even if you are contesting as the mp uh in my parliamentary constituency i will not vote for you but as a corporator no matter who you feel from bnp i will support that person for him bjp is at the center level he is supporting modi i think And some some of that probably comes from the intelligent indian voter who who knows okay this is the party at the center this is who i am voting at the legislative level and this is who i am voting at the corporate level and we have historically at least me personally discounted ki yaar indian voter wo uh, wo do bottle daru pila do uske us pe vote karte nahi in my opinion more recently i don't think they do like that in fact like you were saying ki matlab ye jo election mein hota hai and all that मेरा हमेशा से ये क्वेश्चन है कि ठीक है यार वो दो बॉटल लेके या जो भी उनको पे कर दें एंड देन एक्सपेक्ट बट फिर वो बिहाइंड क्लोज डोर्स हु इज दैट वोटर गोइंग टू वोट फॉर बिहाइंड क्लोज डोर्स बिहाइंड ऑन द ईवीएम जिसके बारे में भी काफी uh in 2019 and even now uh goes for assembly elections in conjunction with the parliamentary elections okay so the odisha voter is going out to vote for both the mp and mla at the same time so when the odisha voter enters the polling booth he or she has to go and press the button in two different voting machines one for the mla and one for the mp in 2019 you had bjp you had congress and the local party there is bjd biju janata dal yeah yeah that's the big party there right what's a big party there and despite bjp and congress being there uh while the voter on an average voted for bjp uh, in the mp election the people voted for bjd in the uh, uh this uh, what do you call the mla elections so yeah. the voter has that level of discernment to say that on this evm i will press the bjp button and in this evm i will go and press the bjd button and He this is this probably system. goes right across the complete rural vote where we think uh, having studied from iims and all that ki hum itne intelligent hain ki yaar ye rural voter bhi humse zyada intelligent hai they know where to press the button yeah 
they they are absolutely see in fact they are a lot more educated than we are uh, when i started bnp i started going around with a few of my team members going and asking people about bbnp whether they know about corporator bbnp etc some people knew some people didn't know interestingly the people who knew who the corporator was what bbnp is uh, the difference between corporator bbnp are these uh, dukanwalas shopkeepers the lower middle class etc they know exactly what it is you go and talk to the educated urban voter uh, we met a few it people and all of them none of them knew who the corporator was or how the corporator actually comes into being whether the person is elected nominated no clue at all so we, we you are absolutely right we are all uh, so called pseudo intellectuals these guys actually are a lot more street smart and they understand grassroots and politics a lot better than we do and they are a lot more nuanced in their thinking as well let's just pause politics for a moment and go back to uh, how you Some got into topic. i am yeah how you got into i am and what your career journey on the last 25 years getting into i am b was a it's a very simple thing uh why i why? first wrote where, where were you before i am b that's what so i uh, i i did my um, b mechanical from bitspilani i actually didn't even know about i am's mba cat etc till my third year in uh, college uh, then uh, i didn't want anyway want to go abroad i was very clear about that even though i wrote gre i didn't apply to any of the colleges so then uh, this thing around cat was going on so i thought i'll also write cat uh, i didn't get through at that was it because you had batch mates writing cat yes yes that's all I, i had no clue as to what one does in an mba and all so i just wrote cat but at least it gave me some understanding ha huh, there's something called as finance there's something called as marketing uh, yes sir hota hai you know you just got that preliminary perspective uh, and then i wrote cat didn't get through and all so i went and joined uh, tata motors what was called telco in lucknow at that time and at that time i was very clear that iske aage mujhe padhna nahi hai right i'll just get into a job i'll keep working on a job and i'll just settle down types but after working there for a year i realized boss i can't continue doing this uh shop floor uh, materials management procurement yes sir and then i said kuch to karna hai uh, i didn't know what to do and then thought again came best way to sort of move out of this is to probably write cat again and at that time i became a little bit more desperate yaar agar cat nahi mila to ye continue karna padega so that's not an option shop floor so, shop floor haan, shop floor right. shop mein um so then i put g jan into cat in that attempt i pretty much got a call from all the four iams uh, then in the interviews i could make it to iam a but iam b c or l sab mil gaya so uh, i am bangalore closer to my home from chennai uh, even though people are saying you should join i am calcutta uh, i said boss uh, i am bangalore uh, if required i can go down to chennai on a weekend and all so that was a decision that drove me to i am bangalore honestly so uh, i would say joining mba was not any strategic move or any long term plan move or anything of that sort job se nikalna tha and then i had to get into uh, something else so uh, but I, by the time i also had one other thing ye finance finance ke bare mein thoda pata chala i have generally been good at math uh, so i said chalo uh, i am a um, uh, uh, enroll ho jate hain let's um, uh, do some finance courses at the end of it ek acha sa fin job lag gaya to finance field mein settle kar lenge types that was the broad game plan but the whole <laughs> thing around uh, doing an mba was out of desperation not anything else. i i i think that's true for most of us out here but uh, but when you said ki ji jaan se lag gaya aur fir cat diya second time round uh, what did yeah. that mean did you take any coaching did you uh, uh, do your self preparation no, coaching no but i took a lot of the material and i used to huh. take a test almost on a daily basis thoda acha sa fight mara previous time at bits it was a very i would say what you call as a casual thing that i did थोड़ा सा जाके लाइट प्रिपरेशन कर लिया जाके लिख लिया टाइप्स दिस टाइम आई आई वांट टू प्रिपेयर प्रॉपरली एंड एंड देन देन सो प्रिपेयर्ड प्रॉपरली गॉट ऑल दिस कॉल्स फाइनली द एडमिट्स प्रॉपरली मतलब यू सेड यू टुक अ लॉट ऑफ टेस्ट या वर यू डूइंग दिस एवरी डे और वर यू डूइंग दिस वंस अ वीक हाउ हाउ डिड यू प्रिपेयर 
honestly if you ask me now i can't remember right it's almost uh, <laughs> getting close to 30 years back right yeah, uh, but yeah. i know that i prepared hard that much i remember i think initially i might have been doing once every i don't know 3 4 days and probably i remember last one month uh, i was doing at least uh, one test a day that much i very distinctly remember uh, but right. the 6 7 months or 8 months preceding that uh, how i prepared i can't exactly recollect but i know that i put in a reasonably uh, sufficient amount of hard work uh, that ultimately merited the call from all the iims god you are talking about 6 7 months before cat so you actually been preparing since then that's a long time maine itna kabhi nahi kiya and that's why i prepared for cat for almost about uh, 6 7 months or even longer but in terms of going forward uh, from once you got into iim bangalore did you have like a culture shock i did uh, uh, when you landed up in iim bangalore the first few uh, first few weeks at least or how did you manage that transition from bits pilani <laughs> and then tata motors and then into iim bangalore where everyone else also cleared the cat correct and and oh, I, i'm very clear it was it was not a culture shock at all i i okay. came into iim with an inferiority complex i thought that uh, i'm going to come across a bunch of really uh, hard hitting uh, high profile people and uh, i came in with a thing saying that jaake dekh rahe the kya hota hai types now <laughs> one thing is that i'll i'll figure out something in my life types so that's all that i was coming in with so when i came in uh, it was intimidating without any doubt you you look at people i i felt that everybody else was more confident than i was so wo thoda inferiority complex diffidence wo sab tha in a way it's actually a good feeling to go through because it helps you focus thoda uh, i remember the first uh, uh, one month uh, i really uh, you know sort of applied my mind into all the courses uh, it got me uh, in in college pilani it was complete tapas pilani mein kuch padhte hi nahi the it was all uh, play fun uh extra curriculars uh just uh, going around with friends etc uh but at imb knowing that uh, there's like all these uh, high profile people that will be there from day one i was uh, fairly focused so in the end i uh, ended up with uh, uh, i would say a, a decent uh, academic record there which honestly i didn't expect that i'll finish at that level that i did uh which which was a surprise but then once you cross that one month you realize that others are also in the same boat many of them <laughs> barring the few you are absolutely uh, right because I, i came from a completely different perspective is like chal yaar ab hum iim mein ho gaye ab to humne crack maar diya and then you come in there and then you realize ki yaar acha ye baaki sab ne bhi iim crack maara <laughs> the one of the things that i realized is my intellect is still at a pretty decent level for me to compete reasonably in that environment that i was uh, faced with so that you know beyond a point uh, it gave me the confidence that yahan se theek thak nikal lenge types but the first one month was uh, heavily focused uh, and and i think partly because of the fear and because of the intimidation that was there uh, in fact second year was the horrible year i you know uh, i think i took things for granted aram se bahut sepa khel liya bahut moj masti kar liya second year mein but first year overall i would say uh i think uh, i just finished outside the top 20 uh broadly which i thought was fairly fairly good uh second year i honestly didn't care at all but at the end of the first year i was some 22 or 23 i can't recollect exactly shikant what was your recollection of your other three host that are interviewing you or talking to you today what do you remember about us from uh, from imb uh no but i i think uh, during the first year doodh ka doodh pani ka pani ho jata hai right so uh during that first year you get to realize that uh, <laughs> mix is uh, like don't <laughs> i know why mix is doing that and uh, mix i'm going to be very uh, obviously honest about it right no no please so, be be oh, brutally honest so we can have some fun he, he, he yeah. he's a politician i'm assuming he won't be brutally honest <laughs> boss you're not voting for him you're sitting That's in it. london so it Karin, i i don't have your vote to win and anyway as i said right subsequently if it's used against me i'll deny it so don't yeah. no so the only person who matters is chow right now but yeah, go yeah. Ahead. <laughs> the only thing that i was seeing was was who are all these people who are above me 
and i could see the, I, i distinctly remember those dms or the slog jo wahan baithte the and i had a reasonable view of the next 10 uh, 15 people who were there wo thoda idea ban gaya that's all that i i, I was sort of in a way i think i was probably i don't know in uh, subconsciously i was probably doing a little bit of a benchmarking in my mind so in a way i used to see what these guys are doing who these people are and then thoda sa lag gaya ki wo hum to dml to banne wale nahi hai uh, that requires you know even more hard work and even more level of application and all uh, and probably intellect wise also probably these guys are you know superior to me from that perspective so i was very comfortable in my space or 20 25 ke level pe tha mera apna space ban gaya mera apna positioning ban gaya and i think by the end of the first term and getting into the second term i became comfortable with where i was and i knew where i fitted in into the whole scheme of things and baki sab log jo hai na i and one thing i'm very clear about uh over a period of time uh, i've never had a superiority complex in my life at all if at all anything i've had inferiority complex at various points of time but i think imb is the place where i got rid of my inferiority complex as well uh and there was no superiority complex for oh, people who were below me in the grades I, i never you know sort of thought about it as well from that perspective as i said the only reason why i was even looking up to these 10 20 people was i i think in a way i needed that validation to get me out of that inferiority complex zone that's all that probably now, there was now 20 25 years later do you think grades matter at i am it obviously doesn't matter too much uh, in terms of how well do you do in your professional uh, career right or success in your life but i think uh, different people will look at it differently for me i think grades did play a role as i said for me to get out of that inferiority complex zone it sort of gave me confidence at some level uh, that you know i can compete with the creme de la creme and find my own position within that and not feel inferior about it uh, i think grades did play a role from that perspective what do you remember about mix like you know i remember something about shikant you know we are a batch of 180 and there's no way you can interact with all the 180 people and you just have some brief memories right so i think the most colorful guy in our batch like at least among the three of us me chow and mix was mix right he was the yeah. most happening guy who is uh, might have been roving guy who might have been uh, watching interesting content in the computer uh, basement that we had so what what's your one line understanding of mix no i see obviously i had a view of everybody uh, all that i'm saying is that i never uh, put it along the lines of grades except for the people above me so mix i always thought of him uh, beyond a point as uh, a bindas guy a bindas. confident guy that bindas uh, is I, the right word yes ha huh, bindas and a confident guy and uh, in fact mix i very distinctly remember uh, i was actually very intimidated by you on the very in the very first day when i came uh, mix if i remember right i i, I don't know whether it's you or jagati uh, one of you i think it's either you or jagati who did one year at imt ghaziabad and then came came to uh, imb that's you right yeah yeah Ah, correct. So, which, which means that's what it's you. I very distinctly remember you. You had done this one year at IMT Ghaziabad, and you had come in, and you were talking with confidence. So, what's up, Mujhe? I felt the fear with all of that coming in as well, right? Baad mein pata chala ki boss, sab log to binda si hai. Wo confidence jo hai, it's confidence in talking, not confidence so much ki my courses crack kar lunga types, right? So, but for me. आप करना क्या चाहते हो दैट ड्राइव की आप क्या करोगे Uh, one thing that i have realized is the intellectual capability of most of us there uh, was not significantly different ultimately i think uh, in fact the reason why i made it to the you know that 2025 uh, range was also because it's not because i'm intellectually superior to many of the others it's just that i applied my mind a lot better than 
many of the others i think there are quite a few people who took it cool there are quite a few others who said boss mai mai i'm in my comfort zone here and i would think that the people who are in the uh, dml category and in the 10 to 20 category put in that much extra application of mind put in that extra effort they were probably a lot more focused in what they were doing as well totally, and i think that's totally. what ultimately in fact i know some of my uh, our close friends from who were not even in the top 100 who i think if they did apply their mind and intent they would be hands down dml i i, I yeah. can name more than a few names in that tell me yeah. some names please it's fine it's fine we will no, no. we will discuss <laughs> offline yeah. on that and the mix would be like i self dominate myself <laughs> yeah. no no apart from me apart from me <laughs> apart from me when i say apart from me of course it is me and some others <laughs> yeah but i i know yeah in a way i had a view of each of you right i i always used to think of uh, uh, vikas as somebody uh, you know vikas had the dml aura around him for sure uh, mancho also uh, mancho i didn't think of it i think mancho you were i think the uh, close to 10 or something I, if i remember right vikas was around 7 or 8 mancho you were around 10 or something uh, i i used to see mancho more i, I think mancho used to run that uh, fin club or some, something on stock trading that he used to do i distinctly remember that yeah he, he used to run it and then he said sab mo maya hai sab mo maya i know that uh, so i distinctly remember some of those things uh, around each one of you so i always thought of mancho as the fin guy uh, vikas as more a uh, uh, a little bit more of a dml aura probably the consult kind of a guy uh, mix as the as per guy uh, Sorry? whatever I, i mix you you were a bindas guy and i i think somewhere i realized that yeah you you would probably be binda and I, and i did feel that there were quite a few people who will do well in marketing in fact uh, i always felt that mix will do very well in marketing actually because i i always felt that he is a very confident speaker uh, oh, that aura of confidence used to come as i said the very first day at uh, imb i did get intimidated by uh, mix <laughs> so all of those are memories that i do carry uh, when i sort of dig deeper into it but yeah but there's nothing uh, beyond that one of the things that i'm bangalore did for me is it it told me that that i was special and i should do something with my life so based on the expectations that the institute put on me right especially someone like desan it should literally treat me with respect that you are someone special you have come to eat food in my place like you know you're special like based on that expectation i've completely failed i've done nothing special the amount of expectations that everybody at i am bangalore puts on its students you know like that's how i feel yeah i don't know uh, because when i when i look at uh, all of you at the dml level uh, or even below uh, mix and uh, you know that's why i said i don't think grades have got anything to do with uh, how well do we do in our lives but most importantly what i also realized is uh, we all have wrong measures of uh, success in my mind uh it's all about what we set out for ourselves and what we want to do and we purely measure it along those lines and i can see if not all of our batchmates most of the people that i know including all the three of you on this call uh there are things that i i i look up to you for i i'm very proud that you are my batchmates and all of you have done something very uh interesting and good in different levels in corporate life and that would be good right for many of the other batchmates uh for uh, kemani uh, even koti the way he doing koti doesn't think too highly of himself in terms of what he's been doing in his life but yeah, i totally feel uh, that he's doing a great job he's very happy in his place what he's doing and he's adding value to you know a set of people and he's very comfortable doing what he is right and i think sometimes we set uh, too high and too long expectations on our own heads and that sometimes pulls us down uh, i can speak um uh, very openly on this call with regard to the three of you i'm very really happy and proud to be with you guys uh, all of you have done exceedingly well in your respective lives you know because when i knew that uh, you had donated a big corpus to imb yeah, i know we were talking uh, the first group was one of our seniors uh, this is in uh, rajagopal from our senior batch and uh, he was talking about it and in fact at that point of time we were actually thinking he seems to have donated more than a crore or so which means he must have done exceedingly well in life and all of that but for me what was most important was 
hey the guys you know you, you could have built a 1000 crore net worth for yourself parting with even 1 crore out of that i know you know i've seen people who do not do that that was very very impressive uh, mancho i know uh, has been the head of corporate development in apollo health street and all uh really those were signs of good progress uh, mix i don't know how you ended up in the private equity world ultimately it was like a complete different thing but i saw the journey that you had undertaken so i have tracked some of these things so being the private equity world you do you know, all of us should be proud of what we are doing you know in our own way so i look at it from that perspective and i am of course very happy and proud of what i am doing myself as well so and holds good for many of our batchmates uh, uh, and i i look at success in a very very different uh, way completely you know i i have gotten to work with chao closely over the last 4 months and the guy is he has very interesting ways to think he's a very very smart thinker so uh, it's just been the way he thinks the way he understands marketing branding positioning it's just yeah. like i can't even get close to that yeah. so a uh, very good website i looked at your website i'm very impressed it's very welcoming it's very uh, it's nice you know when i go here it uh, it straight away tells me about want to do your bit in rebuilding bengaluru you know yeah that's that's really awesome so uh, coming back to the story right how it all started yeah. uh, what made you take that leap because you've hinted at various things why you wanted to do this um, the political angle the social angle and whatever but where's the personal angle what made you take the leap in leaving a great um, employment opportunity or an ownership opportunity with veda and then say okay abhi main politics mein ja raha hu abhi mere ko koi apni income ki certainty nahi hai mere ko apni koi फ्यूचर की सर्टेनिटी नहीं है हाउ डिड यूर पर्स फैमिली टेक इट योर वाइफ एंड हुएवर एल्स आर डिसीजन मेकर्स एंड डिसीजन कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटर्स इन योर लाइफ डिड दे गिव यू सो आई एम ट्राइंग टू गेट इन टू दैट पर्सनल एस्पेक्ट सी एट अ पर्सनल लेवल आई कम फ्रॉम अ बैकग्राउंड वेयर आई ग्रो अप इन अ फैमिली एंड इन एन एनवायरमेंट वेयर वी डेंट है मनी एट ऑल so for me i come from a base where you know even today if i have to go live in a hut for example i would live as comfortably in a hut as in a palatial mansion so for me my needs in life are very simple and straight forward for me the whole thing around earning money was to ensure that my family had a that is the family gets a good standard of living good quality of life the children get the best of education and so on at some point i think that security was created that financial security was created um so once that financial security was created for me money is not a great motivator at all um so i am that kind of a guy uh, today the opportunity that i'm leaving behind on the table is a few crores of rupees every every year and i don't regret it at all in fact i don't feel that i am missing out on that at all uh, so that's one important parameter to note um the from a family perspective obviously my wife has not been very happy with this at all but then beyond the point when she realized that this is my passion she's been fully supportive of that uh and that's all that matters while she doesn't agree that i should be in politics and be doing this with all the nonsense that goes around in politics uh she's not very happy or comfortable but then she is also fully supportive uh, from my perspective as to why i got into this i explained the events but there is one more thing that uh, uh, defines me as a person um i actually have never paid a single rupee of bribe in my life ever it's something very difficult for people to say in india um my passport i actually didn't pay a, a rupee of bribe for my passport itself i actually went to the police station and i have threatened the inspector there saying if you do not give my passport because i didn't pay you a bribe i will go to the police commissioner and i'll ensure that action is taken against you this and i was even 20 years old uh, and i had the guts to go and uh, you know in fact the, i remember the police inspector standing there he was saying are you coming and threatening me here 
I said you consider it as a threat or whatever. I will not pay a single rupee of bribe. And if you get my passport rejected for that reason, it will go to a higher level. And interestingly, I got that passport also. Uh, I didn't get my marriage registered. We went to the the uh, day after our marriage. We went to the marriage registrar. Uh, the guy said you pay thousand five hundred rupees uh, to get. I said, boss, I. You tell me what is the lo- logical charge? Thirty rupees for the application. And if there's any other charge to be paid officially, you let me know. But he said, no, no, you have to pay this. I said, then I won't get my marriage registered. My wife got a shock that day itself, saying, who's this guy? You know, types. So there's a streak in me. I hate it. when anybody asks for a bribe or anything of that sort. I hate it, right? I think there's a streak in me that is there. But then over the twenty years when I was in my corporate life, you don't realize any of that, and you just keep moving on. But when these incidents started happening, when I saw the misgovernance, and when you have a girl dying in front of your apartment, uh, those are all things that shook me up. My blood was boiling with rage on that day. Uh, and because we knew that this was going to happen and we were just helpless and frustrated so if you ask me what is the trigger for me to do this it's just the sheer anger the frustration and in a way it was anger at myself i said boss i am one of the culprits in this whole equation we have allowed things to come to a pass as well so in a way i was blaming myself i said is there something that i can do about this that's when i said okay uh slowly the start uh, the thought started germinating in my mind it, and then it it sort of took control of my senses I said my god what an idea we should do this i didn't even think that oh political party it's going to be tough what will happen etc for me it was just an idea it formulated in my mind and after that i said i have to go get this done and after that i just kept on so the trigger or even today the thing that drives me is that anger and that frustration of course i try to channelize it in a positive way to say how do we make our city better uh, how do we build a beautiful city how do we make it safe for the children for the women for all of us around how do we have a better quality of life how do we leave behind a city that our children can be proud of i live in a city that i am not proud of but at least can i leave behind a city that my children can be proud of i think these are all the emotions these are all the triggers that actually ultimately led me to doing this and continues to Uh, drive me in terms of what i'm doing even today i think i, I think uh, shikant that is a brilliant um uh, summary of why you came into politics i must say uh, this one thing that if on your marriage registration if your wife was uh, all right with uh, your standing up to all those things then she probably was all right with your entering politics and uh, and all that but but thank you so much thank you so much for coming on our show thank you so much for uh, being part of it and sharing your personal stories and professional um, uh, stories uh, no absolutely yes. first of all thanks mix cho and of course vix uh, is not there on the call uh, thanks for this i i as i said when i saw this uh, first time i was not sure what this was uh, i am ke baad etc but hats off to you guys you have continued this and that, that's the power of an idea you you not only have the idea after that you have the guts and the gumption to build on it you then have the perseverance to keep taking it forward um, any idea no matter how small or how big it is that's how it can be given shape to hats off to you guys for continuing this it was wonderful to come here and talk to you guys uh, the only thing that i want from all of you uh, and uh, it's a very obvious thing and i'm going to shamelessly ask for it i need a lot of money to keep running bnp and to ultimately create an impact so any of you can go to the website go to the donate section uh donate as much as you can to support the cause to support the movement and ultimately support uh this emotion called as bengaluru uh, and how to sort of improve the brand of bengaluru and the image of bengaluru anything that you can do for that financially it will go towards that so if you can do that that's my uh main uh, ask of you all of you as well as anybody else who's watching the video please support and in any other way you can as well more than welcome all the relevant icons will be there at the top you know you can become a member okay you can volunteer you can donate so if you want to donate then you fill in these details yes and you can do an online transfer you will get a receipt within 2 3 days and at the end yes. of the year 
uh, all I accept BNP accepts money only through the website. Every single rupee that we receive is accounted. Every single rupee of expense is accounted. It's audited. I have great pride to say that uh, BNP is probably India's only political party that audits its accounts and puts it in the public domain. On this website, our accounts are also put out. So if you go to the citizens portal section, BNP financials will be there. Uh, so all the previous year's financials will be available, the audited financials as well. Yeah. And on every single rupee of expense, uh, under that you have to come to BNP financials. No, this is BNP citizen portal for transparency. So you'll you'll have the different years financials put out there. Wonderful. Right, so and, you can click uh, it Shrikant, is the party enabled to receive forex and all, or is it only INR? No, it has to be only in INR. It has to be from a rupee denominated account, only from a citizen of India or an NRI. And if it's an NRI, it has to come from their uh, NRO account, the offshore account, uh, and not from their NRE account. So it has to be from a rupee denominated account and not from a foreign account. Got it. And if uh, people are interested in uh, becoming part of the leadership team of BNP, I welcome them as well. Anybody wants to contest as a corporator, uh, that contact us page is there. Once they contact, they can give their details. Our team will reach out to them. And that system and all is well set in the site itself. And I think that's the bigger thing in changing Indian politics so, or, or, or Bengaluru politics for the start. is, And people get money. People spend money. But where is the donation of labor? In my opinion, that's the biggest donation uh, beyond donating money. Is is come and hard work with us. Uh, uh, come and let's drive this whole movement and, and, and take this to the next level in whatever sphere we are talking about. And, and, and when I reflect back is that there are so many people whose family circumstances don't afford them to enter politics. So what will you, as a final note, tell those people to enter and join BNP? One thing I've realized is, uh, initially I had some concerns around whether people would be interested in being part of politics. But when I explain the type of politics that I'm trying to drive and the type of politics that I want people to be involved in. The way it resonates with people is just amazing. There are lots and lots of people. Uh, of course, it's still a small chunk of the, a small percentage of the population, but there are quite a few people who are very happy to not just involve themselves, but immerse themselves in this kind of grassroots politics and work very, very hard towards building a better city. And the fundamental reason is because many of them have been involved in grassroots work in different ways, in different capacities. And at some level, all of them are equally frustrated, disappointed, and feeling helpless about what is happening and want to do their bit. People who have personal commitment, financial commitment, find it difficult to get in. But then there are quite a few others who are not necessarily caught in that uh, web, so to say. I, I shouldn't call it a web because ultimately it's a fundamental thing that, uh, you know, the, uh, the personal aspects, financial aspects that drive our lives. But uh, many people, including me, are not necessarily constrained by that. Uh, there are a lot of homemakers in our team. There are people who have actually created a reasonable financial uh, support for their families. Uh, there are people uh, whose spouses actually work and hence, they don't need to do this for a living and hence they are able to uh, join and participate. So for those people, they don't even think too hard. They jump into this and they uh, become an integral part of this journey. So effectively what I would say is anybody who's feeling helpless, frustrated, disappointed, angry about the state of affairs, anybody who's feeling passionate about being part of the change being part of the process that's driving the change, they're welcome. And as part of this, obviously, they need to have some time that they can commit. And the other beauty of the system that we have created here is, 
if you have only let's say one hour to spend in a week for this initiative we have the set of things that you can do to contribute uh, with that limited time commitment that you can provide if you can spend one day in a week uh, we have a set of things that you can do accordingly so depending on how much of time you have and when i say can you spare one hour a week people say absolutely have one hour a week and today there are lots and lots of people in bnp who are spending that one hour a week and that's more than good enough to drive change imagine thousands of people contributing an hour a week can create a significant uh, impact as well so uh, what i'm saying is this level of grassroots politics with the kind of vision focus and the philosophy with the ideology that uh, we are building here this is something people are happy to immerse themselves in they are happy to spend a little bit of their time uh, and depending on what stage in each one's life cycle we are in uh, they can decide to immerse either very deeply or at a surface level and contribute whatever little or whatever much they can contribute and that's thank you so it. much ekan shekan thank you so much for being on our channel thank you so much for yeah. sharing your career journey your journey at uh, before and after iams and for sharing your vision of grassroots politics and where we can go from here and I'm, on that note uh, we'll sign off i'm just going to say for anyone viewing this and listening to this uh, please like subscribe share our episode and if you want to be part of bnp we'll put a link down below and uh, and you can contribute one hour of your life one hour in a week to bnp if you're in bangalore and if you're not uh, you can maybe contribute monetarily and and we'll put those links there so thank you signing off